as a traveling curator, I come across many stories which have not been told before. Uh, the ones that interest me the most are the ones in the context of slavery, colonialism and apartheid. Uh, I find these interesting because most of them have been obscured by history, a history not written by ourselves, and so it is time for us to tell the story from our perspective. I then discovered the work that Patrick Miller had been working on, about the 195 streams of genealogies which make up what is now Cape Town, and that really interested me because I am a Cape Townian and I'm very well aware of the exotic influences on our history which had been hidden from us. So meeting Patrick Mellay and hearing about the research that he had done, the story really resonated with me. And together with him, we decided that we should start a project which would become the Kamisa Museum. Uh, my name is Patrick Tariq Mellay. Um, I grew up here in Cape Town, in what I call Old Cape Town, which is District 6 uh, Woodstock, Salt River area. And, um, uh, my father was born in District 6 and uh, my mum in, 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 in Weinberg and my mother was a single woman looking after me, I didn't know my father and she worked in District 6 as a, a laundry shop attendant and um, so my sort of earliest kind of influences and memories are from that particular time, uh, the time of the district. Our family was a family which were, you know, the colloquial name on the street was half Nazis and that basically meant that our family was part coloured, white, poor white and, and Indian um, in the main. Um, my great grandmother was also part Hosa. Basically our family were like that for 370 years and in fact are still like that today in our children's generation. mixed origin which is why this project interested me so much. There's so much about our family and about our history that we did not know. We did not know about the indigenous component. Much of it was hidden away. We didn't know who the Musbika was in my mother's family. Uh, so I started doing research about myself and that story started to resonate hugely with the Kamisa story. The Kamisa Museum idea goes back 28 years. Um, when I came back from exile and uh, the late Uncle Reg September, Reginald September came back, um, we immediately started to engage with a problem that we saw within our communities that were classified as coloured, that there were antagonisms um, uh, between coloured communities and those communities that were labelled black, and that there was a huge amount of indoctrination so we got together and we said, look, we need to tackle this and we decided to hold a, a series of seminars. We, so we created an organization called the Roots and Visions Forum. And we had a number of very successful seminars where we brought a range of people together. And we had very packed meetings, which got quite heated around, you know, the question of who are we? So it is through this process that went on for a number of years that Reg came up with the idea that you know what we need is a to institutionalize what we were doing to have something we identify the castle of good hope as the place to have it to have a place of memory um, and and history and 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 education and information where our kids could be brought um, and teachers could come to learn about the real history that we had I'm Kelvin Gilfellen, the Chief Executive Officer of the Castle Control Board, the organization that manages the oldest surviving colonial building in the country, the Castle of Good Hope. Part of this exciting uh, you know, calling, I can't call it a job, calling is obviously to look after the built fabric, the, the tangible heritage of the castle. What is very important to me that's driving me day to day is the intangible heritage, the stories untold, half told, wrongly told, of an ordinary woman, uh, ordinary man that walks into the castle and, do, and wonders about where, where we're coming from, where we are at now, and where we're going to. So about three years ago, two or three years ago, there was a Gaul literary, literary festival uh, in Gaul is in Sri Lanka. It's a, it's a beautiful place. And the reason why I became interested in it and why there was a connection between Ruby and me and Angus, Ruby was then the ambassador in Sri Lanka, um, 
the Gaul is a Dutch fort, like this castle is a Dutch fort. And there I met Angus for the first time. So it's there where we met and really connect, and that connection has now lasted for like two, three years. And now this Commissa project where we all three are involved in is really, you know, taking that relationship forward. I'm Ambassador Ruby Marks. Um, uh, at home, of course, um, I'm known as Ruby, but professionally as Robina Marks. I'm South Africa's uh, representative um, as ambassador to currently to Benin and Togo. Uh, but previously in my other postings, I served in South Asia, uh, particularly in Thailand, where I was also accredited to Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia. And after that, uh, Sri Lanka, where I also was accredited to Bangladesh, Nepal and Maldives. The, the journey started before that, um, and it started with, uh, with many conversations that I had with, uh, with Patrick Mallet. You know, um, when I served in Thailand, one of the things that I, that I came across was, of course, um, the fact that uh, before slavery was uh, outlawed in Thailand, many Thais were, were taken by the, by the Dutch East India Company um, from a place called Ayutthaya, and they were transported to Cape Town. And so if you go to our rich archival history, you know, that sits within um, the Ezekiel Museum, you will find that our records date back to people who came from Siam. And so I, I, I felt that, um, you know, there was a sense of um, a diasporic identity um, a sense of um, that we come from so many places, but also a sense that um, our, our gene pool is so wide and so varied. And so I wanted to, to understand that and so began my research in Thailand um, about that particular part of their history. The, the Kamisa Museum concept is also based on tackling this colorized and racialized, um, ethnicized identity that was foisted on us. And we said, look, if we want to project ourselves in a dignified way, it shouldn't be by a race term or a color term, even an ethnic term. We should try and find something that speaks to this rising above adversity, to this diversity that we have within ourselves. And the concept of uh, Kamisa, the Kamisa African identity. And so we wanted to incorporate in what, however we projected ourselves, that we were an African people and, 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 and an African people with many diverse tributaries coming into us. Uh, the Kamisa River is a very nice analogy to use to describe the project that we are working on. Uh, we like the, the analogy with the river which has been driven underground because it's the same as happened to our story. As I began, began to get this awakening about slavery and finding that in fact in my family I had these slave, uh, enslaved people uh, as, as ancestors, um, it spurred me on to sort of ask the question, who were these people? To get some more information about my own history, I did a DNA test and that was quite illuminating. 
It told me quite a few things that I knew about my Dutch heritage, but it also told me about the Khoisan, or the Khoi indigenous element in my family, and then very interestingly about our Southeast Asian connection. When you look at my family and you look at my mother and her sisters, it's quite clear that you see we are Indonesian, South African, Dutch, indigenous. Uh, I come from slave ancestry myself. Um, from my mother's side, my grandfather was Kulosa. And then from my father's side, um, the connection there on my maternal side is Koi. Um, and so I've got a partial identity. A big part of my identity comes from, from um, a slave ancestry. And so um, the issue of um, that the museum deals with runs through my DNA and it infuses my being and it also affects my consciousness of how I see myself as someone who was previously classified as colored within South Africa and um, you know as the daughter of a domestic worker um, uh, you know living in Cape Town with my mom in Seapoint you know and experiencing firsthand the marginalization you know, and the, and the, and just the, the sense of, um, of what it means to be a third class citizen in the country of, of your birth. So, the end product, in a sense, after many, many years, um, was that I came to this discovery about the first trading people, the first trading indigenous people of Cape Town. And it goes long before Jan van Ribbik. These were a community of early traders that took the gap that existed once European shipping started coming here. These Europeans had demands for resources and the Koi, uh, group of Khoi people who had you know, developed into a trading community met those needs. Um, these were the Amakwa people, the, the, the Vatermans, the water people, and they lived alongside a river that ran through Cape Town, still runs today, but underground, called the Kamisa River, roughly translated uh, the uh, sweet water for all. When I went to the records of Dutch shipping, I found that there was over 1,500 ships that came to the Cape on their way to uh, uh, the, the East Indies and on return journeys. And so I went into the shipping logs and I went into what were the ships carrying and how many people they carried. And we're talking about something like, you know, 120,000 people came to the Cape before Jan van Riebeek from other places. And those ships, many of those ships, they had Arab, they had African and they had Indian and Southeast Asian crew. Um, so it wasn't just Europeans that the indigenous people in the Cape were coming into contact with lots of people from all over the world during that period, the pre-colonial period. And so I got a completely different view of what was fed to us in the history books by the colonialists. Jan van Riebeek wasn't the first European to start uh, anything here in Cape Town. These are not just stories which have sprung up in somebody's head. It's based on research over many, many years and consultation with and public participation with various groups. Uh, our research will show that Cape Town is probably the most multicultural city in the world. An exciting and vibrant place, but we need to reclaim our place in history. I'm a torchbearer for the, for the Camisa Museum. I'm here to say that, um, you know, as we do this important art work, because this is work of the heart, but also of the head, you know, as we do this work in South Africa, there are also connections that we have to make with other parts of the world, you know, because our story did not begin in South Africa. You know, our story is a result of the impact of colonialism and the Indo-Atlantic slave trade that took Africans, you know, because we were not slaves you know, um, to start with, we were simply people living our lives, you know. And of course, uh, our own development as, as countries that had been colonized was severely disrupted uh, by, by colonialism. 
Obviously, the Kamisa Museum project is a very important uh, point in the history of museology because it's, it's really changing the way that we look at, uh, at how museums are designed, how they are curated, etc. The way that history is presented, both in public history and in the books, is very like separated. It's apartheid history. Not apartheid in a system, apartheid in separation. There is a white colonial history, there's a there's a black history, there's a so-called color or koi or, or, or nama history. But there's no history that brings all those strands, all those streams together. And you, you would, uh, would hear that I'm emphasizing the streams because it's how, such a powerful metaphor. And with that flow of ebb and flow of that river, the many stories or the many tributaries uh, feeding into that river is at the heart of the Kamisa Museum. This brings us to the very important point of why we wanted to start the Kamisa Museum. We are not doing a traditional museum because as you probably know, most museums are repositories of objects. You go to a museum and you'll find glass cases and objects mainly plundered from colonial times. We are creating a space where you can learn about history, a space where education is front and foremost in what we want to do, and we want to tell our story differently. Now, it sounds very romantic, but they were obviously fight. It's, it's about this position of land, uh, a language, the destruction of the language, the imposition of new cultural norms, acculturation and cultural imperialism. But all of that happened. Now we are here, the children of Kamisa. What are we going to do about the future? I reshaped this landscape. My hands wove the patterns of the vineyards. My feet pressed the grapes and I was paid with the wine. I carry fetal alcohol syndrome children on my back. My name is February. I still march on the eve of December 1st. I walk the cobblestones of the city. When I cry in desperation, remember the emancipation of the slaves. My name is February. 200 years after the Sayose, I was given the vote. They said I was free. But don't you see how often I am submerged, weighed down? I'm the sunken, the soiled, forgotten, and yet memory will not leave me. My name is February, stranded at Third Beach, but no one comes to look for me. No one waves from the dunes, no bridges back to Mozambique. My name is February. I will be resurrected, brought to the surface, unshackled, unchained, unashamed. My name is February.